a couple of verses before we get started. And uh, if you've been around here very long, you already have this lesson plan if you save them. If you don't save them, then there's another, there's a new one for you. Uh, in Philippians chapter 3, and I'm just going to turn there and read it to you. You don't need to turn. It's not really part of our lesson today, but it is. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So if this lesson plan this today looks familiar, it's because it's been taught around here probably several times. If you've been here uh, more than 10 years, you've heard this a couple of times. And Paul said it's not tedious, or the King James says it's not grievous. It's not a bad thing for us to hear truth over and over again. It's, it should inspire us. And the reason we are here in this lesson today is because we have been not doing, air quotes, church as we know to do church since March. You know that? I am the, I'm the uh, Butte section presbyter, which means I have some oversight, um, which I'm not crazy about being in other people's business at all. But I have some oversight over about 12 or 14 churches that are in our Butte section. And I got a call from someone a few days ago uh, after the governor said we can start meeting indoors again. Uh, someone from the church called and said they called their pastor and said, hey, the governor said we can have church again. When, when are we going to start doing that? He said, oh, I don't think I'm coming back. They hadn't been doing any kind of meetings or anything since March. No, no, no pastoring, no church services, no Bible studies, no get-togethers, nothing online, nothing. So a lot of people have not been doing church the way that they're used to, if they've been doing it at all, since March. And in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, Paul said, As you have learned Christ... So walk in him. As you have received the Lord, as you have learned to know God, that's how you walk in him. And the way that I know that I learned Christ, the way that I learned to know him is through worship, through a spiritual connection with Jesus. Not, not religion in my head. I didn't start out with, with, uh, with head knowledge. I started out with an encounter that's why I tell people when they want to argue doctrine or anything, I said, talk all you want. I didn't get talked into this. You ain't going to talk me out of it. Okay? Until you've got something more powerful and a greater revelation than the power that touched me April 4th, 1975, and delivered me from drugs and alcohol and violence and crime and even foul language in one second, and gave me a brand new life, bring it on. I haven't had anybody that can top that one yet. I don't know what's out there and what people are following after, but I, I have found the answer, and I don't need to go looking anymore. Amen? <laughs> Praise the Lord. So our lesson this morning is uh, actually one of my pastor's lessons that he taught me, and why reinvent the wheel? As you have learned Christ, so walk in him. So in John chapter 4, the Gospel of John, we're going to start there. And we're talking about the worship is the door to spiritual reality. Not religion, but spiritual reality. God is interested in being real to humans. That's the, that's the whole plan of, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The mind and the thought process behind that was the purpose to reveal himself to his creation as, as who he is. And God is a spirit, right? John chapter 4, verse 1. 
Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself didn't actually baptize, but his disciples did, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed, he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. That's noontime. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. And there's a whole sermon on why she was there at noon to draw water and so on. Uh, I don't have time to go there this morning, but it's a wonderful story. For his disciples had gone to way to the city to buy food. Verse 9. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Wow. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Abraham or Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, verse 13, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said, give me some of that. Okay? I'm all for that. Man, Lord, give me some of that. So uh, people are on a search. You know, it was called to my attention recently that you can find anything that you want on YouTube. You can find out how to get into occultic practices and summon demons and all kinds of stuff. And there's a whole generation of young people out there that are pouring themselves into that and pouring that into them because they're, they're looking for something real. They're looking for something that's going to touch their life and make a difference. And if you've been around very long, you know that the, some of us went on that search looking for that thing that was going to go wow in my life and say I finally found it but most of us went from one dead end road to another dead end road and some of us finally fell down the you know circling the drain and started the free fall and that none of that stuff works we know it doesn't work the world doesn't know it doesn't work yet but we know so in John keep in reading in John 4 She said, I want some of that. Verse 16, Jesus said, go call your husband and come here. And the woman said, "Uh, I don't have a husband. And Jesus said, you have well said, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands. And the one you are now, uh, whom you have now is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. And the woman said, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, and you Jews say in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. So Jesus said these next few verses are pretty important. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know, but we know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshippers... If there's a true worshiper, what other kind of worshiper is there? There you go. When true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship him. God's on a search this morning. God is on a search. What's he looking for? He's looking for people that will worship him, true worshipers that will worship him in spirit and truth. What will he find when he comes by New Life Assembly today? Will he find people worshiping him in spirit and truth? Or will he find uh, uh, a group of observers observing whatever's going on up here? 
He's looking for spiritual worshipers. Verse 24, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. In John 7, 37 to 39, on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And I think there's, there's the problem with religion is if we get comfortable in our religion, we don't, we're not thirsty anymore. So we're not chasing Jesus to get a drink. We think that we, we kind of settle into our maintenance mode. But Jesus said, if you're thirsty, come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Not a trickle, not a squirt, not a spurt. A river of living water. It says this, he was speaking concerning the Holy Spirit that was not yet given because Jesus wasn't yet glorified. So are you thirsty? Jesus said that you can, you can get a hold of a well that will spring up inside of you and it will produce this living water and you'll never thirst again. What is it? Jesus is talking about himself. He is the one that can give the water of life that satisfies. And I literally, I was on my journey. Man, I, I went through this and this and this and that. It's amazing how much of a mess I could make out of my life in 20 years. A real mess. And when I found Jesus, actually I didn't find him, he found me. I think, it, I think in the spirit realm, it looks something like this. Jesus went walking by the devil and slapped him, and I fell out of his shirt pocket, and Jesus said, I'll take that. And he got me. And I've never wanted to get away, ever. I've never one time wanted to get away or think that there might be something better out there. He is the answer. John 14, 6, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. In Acts 4.12, there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. John 6, 30 to 35, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. 1 Corinthians 10, they all drank from that spiritual rock, and that rock was Christ. Jesus is the well, and the Holy Spirit is the water that's in the well. And the Bible tells us that when Jesus comes in, and this well begins to flow, we have a new source for our life. A new source of input. I got all my input prior to being saved. I got all my input from every ungodly source you can imagine. And some of you were there, so you can imagine what it was. But now there's a new source of input in my life. James 3.17 says the wisdom of God. The verses before that tell you what earthly wisdom does. It's a, it makes a wreck. But the wisdom of God is pure and peaceful and gentle. It's teachable. It's willing to yield. It's full of mercy and good fruit. That's a new input. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says, now we have the mind of Christ. That's a whole new input. That's a mind that's different than my mind. Oh, you Christians, you're all a bunch of brainwashed people. Amen. Amen. My dirty old sick brains needed some good scrubbings. Okay? Not only do we have a new input now, we have a new source of outflow. Romans 8 says that we have a witness. The Spirit bears witness in my spirit. 1 Corinthians 6 says our body, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8, you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you're going to be a witness. That's an outflow. If all we have is an inflow from our doctrine and our church experiences, and there's no outflow, all we've got is a good religion. If you don't have an outflow, you become the Dead Sea. If you don't have an outflow, you become Death Valley. We have to have an outflow. Yes, there's a new inflow in my life. There's a new mind and a new spirit in me. But it's in there, and it wants to come out. John Llewellyn says, and now I've probably said it more than he said it, because I think he only said it once. But it was so good, I say it all the time. If Jesus is really in there, he's going to find a way to come out. If he's really in there, he, he's going to come out. Okay? Not, 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 not the doctrine, not the ideas, not the religion, but Jesus. The reality of Jesus is going to come out. So the book of Acts is really about how 
The disciples, the follower of Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, how he possessed them and drove them into the harvest field. It's all about the harvest field, okay? In the book of Acts, receiving the baptism in the Holy Spirit was the fulcrum of useful Christian living. Useful, what is useful Christian living? It means that, not, not, not useful for me, it's for the world. Am I useful to God in the world? Jesus said, I've ordained you, John chapter 15. I have ordained you to go and bring forth fruit, fruit that remains. We're, there's, we're supposed to be useful to the master. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, he says he wants us to be useful for the master. Amen? He wants us to be the kind of tools in his toolbox when he's got a job to do and he's got someone to reach that he can activate us in a moment's notice and we can be useful to him for his kingdom. So now that I've got Christ and I've got the Holy Spirit, how is it going to work? How does this really enrich my daily life? Not my Sunday life, my daily life. And the answer is our lesson today, worship. Worship is the door that lets that river flow. If I don't worship, that river will never flow, I promise you. Because that's, that's the gate that, that, that opens my spirit is worship. And, and the spirit flows out of me. And it, it brings an anointing to my life and to people around me. Okay? Worship is the way we daily drink from the well. So the question I'm asking you is, how's your worship life? How is your worship life? Is your Christianity in maintenance mode? That you're just going through the motions of getting up and going to work and doing what you have to do to make life work and uh, come home and, and just do it all over again tomorrow? Or is there a, a river flowing? I was coming to work the other morning and I was worshiping. I go through my presets on my radio trying to find something that I feel like got some anointing in it. And boom, there it was. You turn graves into gardens. That was when I got on the freeway at 70 and I cried all the way to work. I've been saved for 45 years. Jesus is still real. And I, I was just worshiping and thanking God that I don't, I'm not in the grave I'm in the garden of God. He put me back together again. Glory to God. Worshiping. How's your worship life? Are we in maintenance mode for ourselves, or are we have an outflow to the world? Matthew chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus said something pretty interesting that should challenge us. He said to the people he was listening, that were listening to him, Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you in a heap of trouble, boy. That'll take you back, some of you. <laughs> Except your righteousness exceeds. Hey, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they had it together. I mean, they dressed the part. They were out in public doing their thing. They were standing in the synagogue giving their readings and their teachings. How's your worship life? Man, I don't miss church. Okay, how's your worship life? Man, I, I get up and go to work and, and take care of my bills and feed my family. I'm a good witness out there. I don't give anybody cause to blaspheme the name of, okay, how's your worship life? How's the reality of God in your life? I'm not asking how is your religion doing? I'm talking about how is your worship life? Unless our righteousness exceeds, goes beyond the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, when I was in the military, when I got saved, I found out right away that um, the world doesn't mind some scribes and Pharisees' religion. They just want, they want you to have enough religion, religion to show up to work on time sober. But when you start preaching the gospel, it's a whole other dimension of life. Because there's some people that are hungry and thirsty, and there's a whole bunch of people that are angry. And they don't want to hear the gospel. They don't want to know about Jesus. Or actually, they might already know. And that's what gets them. 
Okay, moving right along. Okay, the believers receive the Holy Spirit in Acts 19, 1 through 6. Paul said, oh, you're believers now? You got the Holy Ghost since you believed? They said, we don't even know what that is. And he said, well, let me show you. And he laid hands on them, and they started speaking in tongues and prophesying. I walked into the uh, street ministry outreach down here the night after I got saved. Mark Anderson brought me to town, and he said, come on, let's go. And so we showed up at uh, the, the church outreach, minute, outreach ministry. We walked in the door, and he introduced me to Tom Worthen and Bill Bancroft. And he said, hey, this is Al. He got saved last night at the base. And, and uh, one of them said, have you got the Holy Ghost? And I said, what those people in Ephesians said in Acts 19. I don't even know what that is. They said, here, sit down in this chair. Put your hands up. And I did, and they laid hands on me. And next thing I know, I'm speaking in tongues. I don't even know where that stuff came from. So I got saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit before I ever made it to a church service. I got saved on Thursday night, got baptized in the Holy Spirit on Friday night. Sunday, I came to church, and I found out that Ephesians chapter 2 is a reality. Ephesians 2.19, he says, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. That's what happened to me when I got saved. I became a member of the household of God, part of the family. Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, the foundation of the apostles and prophets is the sound doctrine, the teachings of the scriptures. Jesus is the chief cornerstone. He gave the inspiration to the apostles and prophets for their sound doctrine that they give us in the scriptures. And verse 21 says, in whom the whole building, that's in Christ, the whole building is being fitted together or framed together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit. God is building something called the church. And the church, when we come together, the church becomes the habitation or the dwelling place for the Spirit of God. And the reason I'm telling you this all over again is because as I have learned Christ, this is how I walk in him. This is how we know him. Okay? Page three. Here's some rules for worship. Now, the church has a threefold mission. The mission of the church is, and you can see this in the Bible, or you can see it in our Constitution and bylaws for the Assemblies of God, which we're an AG church. Worship the living God, evangelism, preaching the gospel, and discipleship. Okay? Preaching is, is to present the gospel and press for a decision for people to accept Christ. That's, that's the preaching. Teaching is laying a foundation of sound doctrine in people's lives. And then worship is where you connect with spiritual reality. That's the, the real thing, the real deal of the revelation of Jesus in me comes through worship. It doesn't come through my doctrine. After one of my lessons a few years ago, a guy in this church, he sent me a text message, and he said, hey, pastor, he goes, I've been shooting holes in your doctrine all day. I replied to him right away. Well, I'm not saved by my doctrine. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus, so fire away, brother. I don't care. The church that fails to worship fails in our primary vocation or our purpose. In 1 Samuel chapter 3, there's a warning. Samuel was a young man who was literally, from the time he was potty trained, was delivered to the priest at the temple, at the tabernacle, and he uh, was raised by the priesthood in the church. And he had to have someone explain to him that God was talking to him. He grew up working for God, but he didn't know God. 
We can get busy working in the church, working, being an usher, being a Sunday school teacher, being the pastor. We can be busy in the church going about our work for the Lord and not even know the Lord because we just get good at what we do. And we can get so good at what we do that we can come in, do our thing, and go out and feel good about ourselves and never know that God wasn't even within 50 miles of this place. You know that? That's a scary thought. Know this, that without real worship, we're not the real church. Jesus has to have preeminence in everything. When I get done teaching here in a few minutes, uh, our worship team is going to come and lead us into worship. So we haven't been doing this for a while. We've been doing church a little bit different. And it's been impressed on me by the Holy Spirit for the last two or three weeks that, that, once, that once we get the green light to get back in here and, and, and be able to, to court the Holy Spirit, that we, we have to get, we're going back to square one with our teaching here. If you've been around here very long, this is old stuff to you. And I hope it's not so old that you say, oh, I've heard all that before. I hope if it's old stuff that you're, that you're saying, man, it's about time we get back to this. This is what we need. This is what we're built on. This is what my life foundation is on. We have to learn to let the Holy Spirit captivate our hearts. You won my heart, Jesus. He won my heart. He won my heart for 45 years. I've never wanted to do anything except get up every day and just do what Jesus wants me to do. I don't even care what it is. If it's clean the toilet, if it's change the toilet, if it's clean up the, the puke in the pews, I've done all that. The first day that I hired one of my daughters to be the janitor for the church, her first day on the job, and we didn't have chairs, we had pews then that had the, the ends on them, and somebody's baby just downed a full bottle and up chucked it right in the corner of the pew. And she's like, Dad, Dad. So I said, no problem. I'll clean it up for you. I just, I just want to do what Jesus wants me to do. I don't care if it's cleaning up puke or sweeping the floor. Or, I don't care. I just want to do what he wants me to do. Because he captured my spirit, captured my heart. Worshiping God is really the true end of choirs and musicians. It's not a show. 2 Kings 3.15, the prophet said, bring me a minstrel. They needed to hear from God. They said, bring me a minstrel. And they brought him a minstrel. And when the minstrel began to play, the spirit of the Lord came on the, on the guy and he brought the prophetic word of the Lord. So you got to know that Matthew 18 could be possible at any moment. Jesus said, when two or three of you gather together in my name, I'm there. That, that's, that's our goal. And that could happen at any moment if we set our hearts to worship him. And it, it takes time. Don't be looking at your watch and, and thinking about what you're going to be doing after service. When it's time for worship, we got to worship, man. We got to press in. We got to just start telling Jesus how wonderful and awesome he is. And thank God that I'm in the garden, not the grave. Man, you turn graves into gardens. I don't know if you ever heard that song. Go look it up. It's a good one. Okay? Music is the door that opens our spirits. And that's true in the church and it's true out in the world. Music is a powerful spiritual thing. I think it was one of my used to be heroes, Jimi Hendrix. Is anybody old enough to remember who Jimi Hendrix was? Okay. Jimi Hendrix is recorded. I heard, I heard the recording. I didn't hear him when he said it live. But Jimi Hendrix said, we play our music to open their minds and then we preach the message we want them to hear. That sounds like something a, a Christian would say. No, music is powerful, both sides. If you're piping ungodly, unchristian music into your house, you better just shut it off. 
You better just shut it off. Put on worship music, Christian music, things that edify and glorify God. Okay, I've got to hurry along here. Music is powerful. Okay, here's what happens as a result of worship. True worship is a, is a creative power. The Bible says that God is everywhere present. You read it in Psalm 139. God's everywhere present. The heavens and the earth, under the earth, in the ocean, doesn't matter where you go, you can't get away from him. But he's not everywhere manifest. He's not, he doesn't manifest himself everywhere, though he is everywhere all the time. Worship creates the presence of God. Worship creates that habitation of God in the spirit. That's worshipers create that, not observers. Not, not looky-loos. Do you know that people who only observe actually are not a neutral? They're a negative to this atmosphere. When Jesus went down to Jairus' house and he said, he said, my daughter's sick. Will you come and lay your hands on her that she can be well? On the way there, they sent a messenger and said, don't trouble the master anymore. She's already dead. And Jesus didn't pay any attention to him. He just kept going. And he got there, and he said, she's not dead. She's just sleeping. And what happened? They laughed at him. They laughed him out of, would have laughed him out of the place if they could. And so Jesus put everybody out. Put everybody out. Even all the disciples except Peter, James, and John, he took with him into the room where the girl was, and he closed the door. He did not want any uh, negative vibes, if you will. I know that's kind of a New Ager thing, flavors, but it's, it's, if you get the picture, Jesus didn't want any negative uh, attitudes or energy that's going to hinder faith. He wanted an atmosphere that the miraculous could happen. For, for worship to create the presence of God, the manifest presence of God, we have to participate. We don't want to just be observers. And it creates Matthew 18, 20. I'll be there in the midst of you. True worship creates the real church, not our denominations or the buildings, but the true church. True worship sets that atmosphere where Christ becomes the head of the church, where the mind of Christ literally comes and communicates with us. And that's, uh, on, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw you out an invitation. New Life Bible College, we're already into our fall semester, uh, but on Tuesday nights at 8 o'clock, right over there in that area, uh, I'm teaching a class called the, uh, the Manifestations of the Spirit. How God wants to empower us as individuals, members of the body, to activate the spiritual gifts and ministries that are in us. And if you want to start showing up to that class on Tuesdays at 8 o'clock, no charge, no tests, just come on. And we'll, we'll, we'll learn together because that's important. True worship creates that uh, atmosphere where Jesus becomes the head of the church it creates a spiritual body that has all these members. 1 Corinthians 12 tells us about the members of the body of Christ, the gifts of the Spirit, the, 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 the revelation gifts and the vocal gifts and the power gifts that are in the members of the body. And it releases the ministry offices, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. True worship revolutionizes the worshiper. I'm telling you. I've had a couple of experiences. One of them was the night that I got saved, and I haven't lived my life on that experience. I've, had, I've got a, a sure foundation in me. One night when I was getting ready to teach Bible college in probably 1980 or 81, I felt like Holy Spirit drawing me into this room. It was dark in here. It was nighttime, it was dark, and I came in, and as I started down that aisle right there, the farther I got, the, the heavier this weight was on me, and it got harder and harder to walk. By the time I got down here close to the altar, I was uh, prostrate on my, faith, on my face, and I had my hands over my head, 
and the glory of God appeared to me. A light so bright that it, it, it went right through me. A, a, a light so bright that even after it was gone, I tried to go down the hall to the Bible college class and to teach my class, and I could not speak. I, ha- I had to hang on the pulpit like this because I had no strength, and eventually I slid down onto the floor. And, the, and when I finally did get up, everybody was gone. Nobody ever said anything to me about that. <laughs> so probably 22, 23, 24 years later, I was standing in the lobby with Paul Tuttle. He was in the class that night as a student. No one's ever spoken to me about that. We're standing in the lobby 20-something years later. I said, you remember that night down there? And I pointed down the hallway, and he went, yes. (laughs) It had an impact on him, too. Spiritual reality leaves an indelible mark on the believer's. Ask Isaiah what was the highlight of his life. He said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And he fell down and covered his face and said, woe is me, I'm undone. In Isaiah 10, 27, it says, the yoke is destroyed because of the anointing. This is a, it's a revolutionizing power. If, if you've got yokes and bondages in your life, It's not about the pastor or the ministry coming by and razzle-dazzle zapping you on your head and having you fall on the floor and whatever. It's about, and I'm, I'm all for that, by the way, but it's about a spiritual encounter with Jesus where his anointing breaks those things off our lives. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says there's a new person inside of you, and that's what makes the connection with the Holy Spirit. True worship brings New Testament ministry. True worship is the magnet that draws the multitudes. When Pastor Hood, and some of you won't even know these names because you're new around here, but when Pastor Hood was retiring, they were going into semi-retirement, and his son-in-law, Dave Baker, became our pastor. And Dave's a visionary. He, I mean, this guy, he sees stuff all the time. He's always got an idea. He has more ideas in 30 minutes than I have in 10 years. And on top of that, his ideas are usually good, and mine aren't. But Dave had this great idea. He said, told Pastor Hood, he goes, we need to sell this property, this 10 acres here, and buy those 11 acres over there at the entrance to Edgewater. That's zone commercial and build a church. We need to get out on the highway. We can get a big sign up where people can see us. And that, that's a good idea. The so Pastor Hood said, son, get that pulpit out of the church, put it in your car, head towards Oroville. You get about halfway to Oroville, turn right, and you see a sign that says Rackerby or Bangor or something. Turn right and drive out there till you get to the end of the dirt road. Get your pulpit out of the car, go up on the hill and set it up underneath an oak tree. And if God is with you, they will find you. God's anointing is a magnet that draws people. And I'm telling you, it's true. It's true. His anointing is a a magnet that draws the heart. Everybody wants a drink of that. Everybody wants a drink of it. Amen? Worship is the door to spiritual reality. So how's your worship life? Um, Since we haven't been able to do church the way that we do church, that we know to do church in a while, maybe it's, I'm going to welcome our worship team back right now. I'm only one minute over. That's pretty good for a long-winded guy. And in a moment, our uh, junior hires, high schoolers, uh, will be joining us from their class if they're over there. But this is a chance to rekindle. This is a moment to rekindle the fire of God in your heart. Amen? This is, this is an opportunity for spiritual reality, not religion. Not, yeah, I go to New Life Assembly, or I was over there at that church on J.N.R. Boga, and 
Yeah, it was a good message. That's not what it's about. It's about the reality of Jesus Christ in me. Christ in me is the hope of glory. You turned my grave into gardens, Lord. You won my heart. You changed me. You gave me a life and a wife and kids and grandkids. You gave me a wonderful church family. You gave me spiritual truth that helps me to know you in my spirit, Lord. Glory to God. Lord, we welcome you this morning to minister to us and through us, Lord, to bring your mind into this place today. Lord, to reveal your thoughts and your will and your purposes in our hearts and in our congregation today. Father, I pray this in Jesus' great name. Amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Won't you stand up with us this morning? Let's worship the Lord and give God the glory that's due his name.